Welcome back to the Talent Development Hot Seat. I am your host, Andy Storch, and I am so grateful that you are joining me today for an interview with Sarah Macanini from PwC. And Sarah is a partner and the digital talent leader for PwC across the U.S. and Mexico. A member of the People Leadership Team, she is responsible for enabling success across all talent elements of PwC's digital transformation priorities. A firm believer in the power of employee experience in future-proofing organizations, Sarah is passionate about amplifying business potential by combining talent with technology skills and tools. She is a recognized leader with respect to organizational diversity and inclusion and is driven to the level the opportunity field for people of all genders and those from underestimated populations. Prior to joining PwC's Boston office, Sarah spent time with the PwC in Ireland, London, New York, Seattle, and Sydney, where she also gained private sector experience. Sarah, welcome to the Talent Development Hot Seat. Thanks for having me, Andy. Yeah, it's really great to have you on. You have such a wide range of experience working in so many different places um, and are really kind of on the, the cutting edge uh, you know, thinking about things like digital transformation and the future of work and, of course, um, diversity and inclusion, which is a hotter topic than ever. Uh, so I'm really excited to have you on and, and have a conversation with you today. Um, before we dive into any of those topics, uh, I thought it'd be a good idea to start with a little bit of your background. So um, tell us how you got to where you are. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think uh, you, you laid it out pretty well in terms of where I've been and getting to here. But I think kind of how I ended up here passion wise is probably a different story. So might surprise you to know that I did start out in humble beginnings as an accountant and auditor. I don't admit it very publicly, but I will admit it to your listeners. <laughs> um, but through that role, I got to see tons of client organizations and how they were dealing with talent and trying to keep up with technology. Uh, so I got super interested in that. And then through working with a bunch of technology organizations, I became really into the startup space and looking at how uh, startup organizations were dealing with talent and approaching things a little differently from a culture standpoint. So the more and more I got involved in that world, I decided to go back to grad school and get my MBA and kind of explore a little bit more, expand my horizons and see how I could then take that learning back into PwC and um, help be part of our talent agenda now that I had a little more, a little more learning behind me kind of on the expertise. So transition what I was trying to do advising clients into making PwC my clients. Ah, interesting. And uh, did you do the MBA while you were working at PwC? I did, yeah. So I commuted back and forth between Boston and Chicago for about two years. Uh, so a lot of United Miles, a lot of Starwood Points, and uh, a lot of money later, here I am. Uh, but best thing I ever did, best two years of my life so far. Oh, I can relate. Uh, I didn't fly as much, but I also did my MBA part time while I was working when I lived in LA and did my MBA at USC and uh, awesome. a lot of driving back and forth um, doing those classes in the evenings, but made so many friends, learned so much. It was uh, such a fantastic experience. And, uh, you know, you get you really learn how to manage your time and you wonder what are those full time business students do <laughs> with their days. Yeah, there, yeah. It, the travel definitely gave me a lot of time to catch up on a lot of reading and podcasts and uh, homework, I will admit as well. That's awesome. Okay, so tell, tell me more about what you're doing today at PwC, because it sounds like your role is, is fairly unique um, compared with other people I've interviewed on this podcast. Yeah, so it kind of emerged from, uh, you know, PwC has a, a massive, as many organizations do, a massive digital transformation agenda. Totally driven by market forces, what our clients are looking for in terms of value, quality, doing things more tech enabled, and of course, always trying to control costs. So that's, you know, probably nothing new that you haven't heard from anyone else. Um, I was really excited by that. As we were building out that strategy, um, I asked basically to play, to play a role in it and help to kind of design my own role. Um, so we've been very focused on because we're, you know, massively a people organization, our main thing of um, making sure we continue to stay relevant and, and thriving in this world is investing in our people. And with the technology advancing at the pace that it is, you know, as much as people may try to, we really can't hire our way out of the problem of um, having to have more technology skills more frequently. And as part of our purpose, we're really committed to investing in our people. So. I saw a really good intersection between my client experience, my education, and my passion with what the firm needed. So it was as simple as, it sounds simple now, but um, crafting what I believe to be kind of a business case for this job, uh, working with my, my bosses and saying, hey, I think I could really unleash some great things if I did this on our organization. Why don't you, 
give me a shot. And if I do great, let me do more. And if I don't, maybe I'll figure out what's next. Right. Um, so that was about 18 months ago. And I got really involved in our digital upskilling agenda. And then it's evolved into a bigger role to, to kind of future proof our workforce in this digital world. So that's how I ended up where I am. But it really was literally me creating my own job description and, and putting it down on paper. I like that. So you're future proofing the workforce for the digital world. I definitely want to get into that. Um, sure. For, for reference, how big is PwC now? Yeah, sure. So around the world, we're about 250,000 people, but we're organized in a way that we are kind of a network of lots of legal entities in every territory. So my responsibility primarily spans the US and Mexico, which is a combined entity of about 50,000 people, give or take. Um, so that's kind of my remit, but we do, of course, work with other people in the network, in, in the PwC network around the world. And given the size of the U.S. being approximately 20% of our workforce, we obviously have a major influence in how we shape the direction of the global organization, too. Yeah, I mean, that is a massive organization, and I'm sure it that <laughs> you being here uh, in North America, particularly the United States, a lot of other regions are looking at what you're doing here and figuring out, okay, how can we do that for our own region? And probably asking you for help with some of that stuff. So um, yeah. let, let's get into that. This idea of future proofing for the digital age. I think a lot of people and a lot of companies, you know, this idea of digital transformation has come up a lot. As you mentioned, almost every company is going through some type of digital transformation, right? And I, I yep. can't go to a, a meeting or a conference without hearing someone say, well, we used to be a paper company, but now we're a technology now company. Now we're a tech company, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now we're a tech <laughs> company. And they're like, wait, what? What? Um, but a lot of companies are doing that very necessarily and it's the right move and they need people to drive that. So how are you attacking this and, you know, quote, future proofing the workforce to make sure they are ready for that digital age? That yeah, well, as you can imagine, future proofing 50,000 people is a, a zero pressure assignment. So <laughs> we'll see how well right. I do. But right. um, so, so in case your listeners aren't familiar, we're a professional sor services organization. We have three primary areas of business. One is accounting and auditing, so giving assurance on external party services. Another being tax services, so that's everything from tax compliance, what you might imagine organizations just doing tax returns and, and then consulting to do tax planning. And then our consulting business, which we call advisory, and that's advising clients on everything from technology implementations to um, doing you know, strategy changes and even doing what I do for our clients too. We have a workforce of the future consulting. Um, and then we also, of course, have thousands of people who enable our own business, our, you know, our human capital function, our finance function, our lawyers, and so on. Then I'm responsible across that world, so I'm not looking just at accountants or just at consultants. But when I think about taking it on, I mean, I, my client is PwC, even though I work for PwC, if that makes sense. So I work with the leaders of our business and looking at where we believe our business is going. And even though we are a regulated entity, which, you know, in this Type of world can you know be on your side because regulations can move kind of more slowly than than other parts of the world so it can slow down innovation in your industry we do understand that a lot of what we do can and should be automated and you know we want to get ahead of that you know the classic disrupt yourself before somebody else does so as you look at all of the services and products we offer and then the ones that we'd like to offer in the future as we kind of evolve our business model i work just very methodically but in sprints with our business looking at what we might do differently and then prioritizing that because you know if we try to attack a thousand things we could probably sit here on your podcast next year and still be talking about 200 of them but we look at what could we do every six months and keep iterating so that we're making small steps but we're making tangible progress because for me it's all about the employee experience and is this going to continue to be a place that people want to voluntarily work yeah, it makes sense. So when you, you start to look at all those things that be, need to be done, how do you sit down and prioritize to make sure that you're focused on the right things, the right areas? Uh, I think a lot of it, Andy, goes to you know, what we think people are, our clients are going to want to see the most value in going forward. If, if there's a business that we believe is, is what we would call go long, so something we want to make sure we continue to invest in, we think there's a big tail on that. That's a priority for us. Um, we, we tend to deprioritize things that you know are either not our core competency or things that are not frankly quite profitable for us. So we you know we continue to do that portfolio review just like any organization does with their investments. 
we have the the luxury and also the responsibility of being a, a partnership. So we're not a we're not a publicly traded company, but uh, I and 3,400 other partners we own this firm. So it's our responsibility to make sure we're holding ourselves accountable to the investments we're making and you know delivering return for our people in the future and not just every quarter, which is uh, you know something that public companies have to unfortunately deal with. Yeah, and you've got um, a, a unique workforce. Not only is it big, but you've got a lot of uh, very highly educated, highly skilled, um, highly trained individuals out there, uh, not only working within the organization, but especially doing client work. And so they need to be at the top of their game and, and know what's going on and be you know, almost operating with the, the latest and greatest right, tools and technologies. So what, what's the approach to keeping people up to date and having people working in the most you know, effective way in this digital age and, and really kind of future-proofing that, that workforce? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that because that's where I spend at least half of my time is kind of on this, what are the skills people have? What are the skills they will need? And then how will they stay current? I mean, the biggest area of interest and passion for me personally is the trends, are the trends in the future of learning. Uh, so I follow that really closely. You know, what will the future of traditional academic institutions look like? What will the, the content that they deliver? In what modality? Will people even finish a four-year program in, you know, in our lifetime? I, I don't necessarily believe so. Um, or at least that I think the trends in that space are really going to change. So I mean, our view is, you know, the, the pace of change, and it's probably cliched at this point, but the pace of change is definitely never going to be as slow as it is today. So it's just going to be, you know, speed, 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 everything's going to keep changing. Um, so we look, you know, we don't believe we have kind of the, the be all end all solution to what are the right technologies and skills, but we we're informed by what the market is telling us in terms of what should people be using, what can they use that are easy to get in their hands if they don't have a computer science background. Um, so that's really important to us. We think we can pair, and we, we've seen this proven out, you know, many, many times, pair a traditional business background with a technology acumen that doesn't necessarily require you to be a coder from 10 years ago or something like that. So we work with tons of, you know, automation tools, robotics, data, visualization, get tools and skills in the hands of people really, really quickly, and they just thrive on it. They just run with it. They learn it. You know, it's people learn from their peers. Um, and I think what we're seeing a big, big trend towards is this concept of digital badging. So that's kind of micro credentials, um, something that was started by the tech companies a number of years ago, where you'll see companies like Salesforce and Google and Workday credentialing people and certifying people in their products. And now talent and prospective talent is asking us, okay, that's great. That shows me what tools I can use, but is there a way for me to put in a, you know, in a verifiable way? something that I can communicate what skills I have, because this concept of lifelong learning is really where it's headed. This, you know, I, I call it a lifetime GPA almost. And, you know, although I feel like I focused on this by going and getting my MBA, I think the real future is in people are, you know, traditionally graduating undergrad at 22 years old. And the majority of what they learn, if they look back at, at their retirement, probably happened between 22 and their retirement. So mm -hmm. what can happen in a way that's, you know, people can communicate socially consistently and with rigor between the day they graduate formal education and finish their career. So this concept of digital badging around skills is a really, really hot space. And, you know, PwC and our learning team is really investing in this for the people we have today and the people that will join us in the future um, so that on their LinkedIn, on their email signature, even they can display the skills that they have and communicate them to the outside world in a way that's not just what, how creatively did you decide, decide to put bullets on your resume? Well, it's interesting, right? You used to be able to get a degree in something and say, well, I've got this degree in this thing yeah. and now I can go work in this for 30 years. And that's not to say that in the past people weren't looking for ways to learn and do things differently, but now, the, like you said, the pace of change is so fast that, uh, you know, you, you come from a CPA background, right? I, I know if you're an accountant, uh, then you, you have to keep doing continuing education, right, along the way to, to keep up with your, your CPA and stay licensed. And some of these other things, I don't know how it works with all of them, but I imagine the rate of change is so much faster that you really have to keep learning and updating. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, to be up to date on that stuff. Otherwise, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be obsolete. It is going to be obsolete. Yep. And, you know, I think we're very focused on what are the skills people learn because the tools may be obsolete too. You know, coding languages come and go. 
software products come and go, they get acquired, they change names. So as long as people are learning the right skills, I think frankly, you know, learning things like critical thinking and how to make an argument and how to write are, are gonna serve people a lot longer 20 years from now when technology I hope will exist that we don't know about today. Yeah, there will be a lot that exists in 20 years that we don't know about today. But uh, one of the things that I'm counting on is that pe people skills, leadership skills, um, those types of things, critical thinking will be similar and just as important, if not more important um, than they were before. Um, I'm curious, this is not as much about talent development, but you mentioned the, the future of education and the four year degree. Um, I, I've talked with some other people about that in the past. Like, where do you see that going? in the future and obviously i'm not going to hold you to this prediction but <laughs> with the idea that people are not getting a degree and then working in that area for 20 years like or 30 years like they used to um, where do you see that going do you see large companies like a, a firm like pwc even hiring consultants without a degree if they've gone and gotten the necessary skills through alternative means yeah, it's a really interesting question. It's a really hot space that I spend a lot of time in, even just looking at what would that do to our hiring requirements and all of the things that go with that. Um, I think everything's on the table at this point in terms of what is considered the right qualifications, especially for an entry level education, I mean, an entry level position. Um, you know, what does someone really need to be able to demonstrate, which may frankly not come from a degree. Um, I think a lot of organizations are pairing with academic institutions to give college credit for work experience, which you know may help people, populations that haven't been able to finish their formal education in the past. But I do think just this concept of, you know, in, in the US especially, that the, um, the student loan crisis, I'll call it, is, is really just crippling for some people. And if you look at the value of what they're getting in some cases from four years of classes that may not be super relevant to what they'd like to achieve for the next 40, 50 years. And you know, that age is probably even going up as people live longer and longer. I think everything is on the table. I do think there will continue to be credentialing. Uh, I don't, I probably don't think in our lifetime we'll ever see no one getting a formal degree, master's or so on. Uh, but I think the numbers will change. I think people will take it with them as the person more than the institution. I think people may transfer a lot more from institution to institution and just build up this backpack, if you will, of skills and badges and credentials as they go that all kind of piece together. Uh, a lot of consortia and you know organizations are, are working together to kind of help think through what that would look like even even on a global basis yeah and i i would i would like to think there might even be more of a focus on the experience and the connections because i would love that you know you and i both have mbas when people ask me about my experience of getting an mba it's been 10 years now and i have definitely i mean i learned a lot in that experience, but I've learned a lot more as a consultant the last eight years. Um, but the connections I made, the lifelong friendships I made while I was there, um, people that I'll be friends with forever and that I can go back to and use as resources for different things, um, that's almost invaluable. And that's you know what I think was the greatest benefit of, of not only the college experience, but especially the business school experience. So I, I would like to think that would probably be highlighted more when people can go and get skills in other places without paying uh, you know $80,000 or more for a degree. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, as we look at, um, you know, we're very focused on as we digitize our, our people and their skills, and we're very focused on not just teaching tech with tech, which is obviously the way things are going, but there are lots of modalities people learn in and that people find effective. So having this flexible, self-directed learning path is really important to me. But two things that you said really resonated with me, which are very important to my team strategy, which is, are, are we making sure that people are getting the human skills that go with all of those tech things? So it's not just um, the social aspect of it, but are the things like um, empathy and design thinking and user experience and learning how to tell a story. If people can't do that, frankly, everything that could be automated, we, you know, we could eventually have a robot do it and you know, currently even offshore a lot of that, but that's not what we're looking to do when we were trying to bring insights. So trying to stay ahead of the technology, the human skills is key. Um, and then, I mean, I'm in Orlando right now, sitting in a hotel room where even though what I'm here for is bringing people together to really accelerate some of their tech skills, they're here to have an immersive experience where they learn through play, they learn very differently. It's a lot of fun, but it's also, Andy, about the social connection and building community is a lot how people learn. I think gone are the days when you say, sit in the classroom, someone will talk to you, you'll probably be on your phone for 10 hours. Yep. Instead, let's learn together, let's learn in teams, let's realize that, let's leave our titles at the door and learn as peers. 
Yeah, absolutely. And those experiences become so much more important. I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to ask you about uh, the employee experience, which I know you're a big believer in and how people can learn from those experiences. And so you mentioned, just as an example, you're in Orlando across town from me right now, um, <laughs> you know, where you're bringing uh, several, I think, hundred people together from your organization. Uh, what's your approach? Because you mentioned these really important skills that people still need to develop, all of them are more human skills that they learn in person. So what's your approach to making sure that people gain those skills? Um, how are you developing them? And do you build everything internally? Do you use partners? Is it, um, you know, in-person workshops? Do you use digital? What, what's the approach? Uh, so all of the above to everything you just said, uh, we do have a world-class learning team. Um, in the U.S. alone, I'm going to say our learning team, I might get this wrong, but you can quote me, it's about 300 professionals that work full-time for us um, on the learning and development front. Actually here with me is uh, Katrina Salem, our chief learning officer, and a lot of her team who helped to architect this program. We do work with a ton of outside vendors too, just making sure we're bringing in the latest thinking and also that we're not building stuff that you know, we can easily buy and already exist at high quality. So between the technology, the creative, the production, and then the kind of psychology behind the learning outcomes, it's a mix of PwC and external people. Uh, it's been a really great experience. It's been humbling, honestly, for me to help put this together. Uh, we're focused, we have a commitment from our, our CEO on down, and I'm, I'm fortunate to work with him and his team directly. So I do feel like we have the commitment from the very top of PwC not just a financial commitment, but the true belief that this is something that needs to get done. So we've made a commitment publicly and to all of our people that we will upskill everybody. Uh, we will leave no one behind to the extent they choose not to be left behind. We're not gonna drag them kicking and screaming, but we're gonna make sure the tools, the skills, the resources, and the people and the experiences are in their hands. Um, but it is all about, for me, it's all about the employee experience. I think you know a lot of companies like Amazon and others will make a point of, this customer obsession, which I fully agree with because that's how people stay in business. But for me, the employee is the customer. And I think we need to make sure we treat our employees like consumers too, because let's not forget they're choosing to buy this employment experience from us. We're not, you know, we're not holding them captive here. So we want to make sure it's something that they're going to tell other people, hey, you need to go work here too. You need to consume this. I'm having fun. Uh, so we're rolling out a lot of things that might surprise people from an accounting firm. <laughs> Yeah, and you've got, uh, again, like we mentioned, highly skilled, highly educated employees that certainly, if they're high performers, like many of your consultants probably are, they have a choice to go somewhere else, right? So absolutely, want to create, give them this great experience and treat them as customers or consumers so that they want to stay and keep working. And as I've been out there talking to a lot of talent development professionals, um, especially those on the cutting edge, what I hear is that, you know, workers today especially um, those in, have entered the workforce in the last few years uh, are putting, placing even a greater um, emphasis on career development, talent development, and this is really important. They wanna know they're gonna be able to keep learning and growing, so it sounds like you're, you're providing that experience for them. Yeah, I mean, it might sound counterintuitive to the human comments I just made, but I almost wanna treat our, our employee experience like a software product, so mm -hmm. continuing to iterate, uh, using Agile, using a ton of design thinking, making sure we have the voice of the customer, and in this case, the customer being the employee, and not just presuming we know all the solutions for what people want to team together, to communicate, to collaborate. Um, even things as simple as, you know, we work to make sure we had different spaces for people to work in. We don't have a formal dress code anymore. Things like that, that might seem, I mean, they're free for us to do, but just the fact that I can now wear sneakers and a t-shirt to work makes a big difference to me, and I, you know, it's part of, being able to express yourself, the individual, and that's a lot to do with people feeling belonging at work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of expressing, being able to express yourself at work, I know that um, diversity and inclusion is something that's really important to you as well. I mentioned it in your, it your bio earlier. Um, what type of things are you working on there and how are you seeing just in general that stuff changing for companies um, that you've dealt with or, or read about? Um, out in the, in the marketplace? Yeah, I mean, I think it's gonna, I mean, it's table stakes, obviously, and nothing you haven't heard before, but I mean, to be a successful and a, a long-standing business today, I think, you know, you're not going to be successful if you continue to, to go down traditional paths. We, as a, you know, bigger than my role, but we, as an organization, we have a, a very big commitment. Our, our senior partner, Tim Ryan, has made a, 
uh, led an organization called CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion, which uh, he calls his peers, other CEOs and other leaders to sign on commitments to uh, various things around diversity and inclusion, whether it's unconscious bias training. Um, but uh, the, the main thing is just being, making it a safer place for people to have conversations. You know, unfortunately, we live in a world where there continue to be a lot of social conversations around things that um, we wish weren't happening or a lot of us wish weren't happening. And, uh, you know, him and his peers across organizations have made a big commitment to having those conversations in the workplace not be taboo anymore. We unfortunately lost a colleague of ours in Dallas about a month ago to a shooting and that's created a, you know, and it sparked a new demand, demand for these conversations in the workplace. So being more inclusive is, is just table stakes for us. For me personally, I'm really uh, focused on the gender element of diversity. I truly believe that um, there's still a long way to go in being inclusive of all genders and a lot of ways that people are not intentionally being um, discriminatory or anything, but certainly wanting to be more inclusive and you know get rid of blind spots and we do a lot around that with um, the public as well as with our own people and training people for blind spots and making commitments. And I have a platform where I can you know, really influence that now in terms of technology and the role that we play working with organizations that are focused on diversity specific to technology. Um, you know, there are a lot of women in tech organizations that we can partner with and, and uh, work with and a lot of nonprofits too trying to reach people earlier in the, in the talent life cycle. So, elementary schools, public schools, and just underserved uh, populations before they, before they even get to their full-time employment phase. Yeah, you mentioned those, those blind spots. Can you give a couple examples of um, blind spots that are pretty common in, in a lot of different organizations? Yeah, I mean, a really common one in um, the employment space is this concept of halo and horns bias. So um, people have a tendency, of course, unconsciously, but to have a single experience with someone and base their future prediction of their performance on that experience. So let's say, Andy, you and I work together, you did a phenomenal job, and then two years from now I say, oh, Andy's available to help me again, he's amazing. But I really don't know that you've been amazing for two years. And conversely, maybe you had a bad day and the one thing we did together for an hour and I tell everyone forever, Andy sucks. So these biases are That's things that unless you're, unless you're intercepting them, um, they're really, you know, they're really pervasive and amplify that by other, you know, blind spots and people's, you know, confirmation bias where they just believe something and then they look for a way to confirm what they believe, even though there really is no actual evidence. So yeah, it's like, you know, I, something as simple as I could say to you, um, I like, you know, I, I think it's going to, the hurricane is going to hit right now and it suddenly starts storming and I'm like, see, I told you so. so it's like, of course you couldn't predict that. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and you base so much on that one first experience. So now I'm thinking, you know, my experience of you, Sarah, in this interview is that you're so knowledgeable, you know so much about this, you're fun to talk to. Uh, but what you're <laughs> saying is down the line, if I'm looking for another guest or looking to recommend someone, I shouldn't base it on just this one experience. I should do more research. <laughs> that's right. Sure. You should check my LinkedIn reviews before you go any further. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are very prolific on LinkedIn. Uh, that's how we connected in the first place. And uh, so I, I'll definitely have to check back there to see what's going on. Um, but going back to your work, what's been your, as you've been going into this, and I know it's a very uh, daunting task, and it sounds like you have tackled it head on. Um, what's been your greatest accomplishment to this point so far? Uh, I, I mean, I have to say, I'll say accomplishment so far for sure, because I think I'm just getting started. I, I think there's a lot my team and I are really going to do in the next couple of years. But um, our digital accelerator program is probably the thing I'm the most proud of. So that's a, a cornerstone of our upskilling agenda where we invited all 50,000 plus of our people to apply, to self-nominate for a chance to be a digital accelerator. And what that is, is someone who wants to take their upskilling journey to a real other level. So we've cleared the plates of the people who we selected. Um, about a thousand people were selected out of 3,500 applicants, which in a traditional 169-year-old organization is, is pretty neat that 3,500 people applied for a job. They didn't even know what it was. Um, so we, we selected 1,000 people, and they, they go through, uh, along with all those human skills I talked about, these immersive experiences with storytelling and design thinking and so on, they get pretty intermediate to advanced training on data and automation and even up to AI and machine learning, natural language processing. 
their, their schedule is cleared for two years and they get to just go into our business again and apply everything they're learning back to the business they came from. So they're pairing their business acumen with their new digital acumen and looking to accelerate our digital transformation. So a massive investment, as you can imagine, pulling a thousand people out of their day jobs. Um, you know, between the loss yeah. utilization they would have had in their old world, but we think it's it's absolutely necessary to distribute the skills at the scale that we need. Um, so getting that designed, funded, stood up, um, concepted, and then getting the support to take a thousand people away from my partners <laughs> was um, <laughs> it was a pretty fun but um, all out few months. Um, it was probably about nine months start to finish from kind of drawing it on a piece of paper to getting the first class through the door last July. So it was a, it was a, it's been a very rewarding experience and they're a really cool connected community of individuals. The application process was blind on the diversity and inclusion front. So uh, they weren't interviewed. We didn't know who they were when they applied. We knew nothing about them. And then we sorted that down purely based on their application and then match them up with the business areas in our uh, firm that needed the most help. Hmm. So that's that's definitely the thing I'm the most proud of and probably the thing I'm the most known for. We have a, a co communications campaign that goes with it that's all space themed and astronauts. So you'll probably see a lot of that on social media too. Nice. I'll have to look out for that. <laughs> um, and I, I think it's so cool that you did that. Um, you know, you took the blind approach so that to take the the bias, unconscious bias out of it. Uh, since that is something that you're working on anyway, but that adds a, a whole nother challenge to it, but you're able to, to pull it that does. Off. Yeah. Growing up in Ireland, that's, uh, that's how the college application process is there. So something very near and dear to my heart and then kind of learning how the, the U S college application process being a little less blind. <laughs> I was curious <laughs> yeah. to try and experiment here and, and see, I think it's hard though, because, you know, we are a very people led business. Our partners know their people. They want to make sure that the person they're investing in is getting a chance. But I think a lot of people were surprised that people came out of the woodwork that were like, Hey, I'm teaching myself Python on the side. Maybe I could apply stuff that they just weren't socializing at work because they thought maybe if they expose these new skills, they'd be getting pulled into too many things. Right. And the time was the big thing. So now that we gave them, Hey, we're going to give you two years worth of time to work on this. Suddenly, all these secret technologists started showing up. It was fantastic. Interesting. That's huge. Plus, you also, you kind of normalize the field for the introverts who may not be as likely to go out and brag about these new skills yeah. they're going and developing compared to the more social people or the extroverts that are talking all about it. Yeah, actually, their first day on the program, we um, give them, with their permission, a pretty detailed personality test. And we look to pair them up in teams as they go forward based on you know, different personality types for that exact reason. Oh, that's so interesting. Well, that is quite an accomplishment so far. And uh, knowing <laughs> that you. you are just getting started, like you said, um, with a growth mindset, you know, I know that people often oh. learn best from failures and mistakes. So what's been are your- Are you a Carol Dweck uh, reader? <laughs> oh, yes. I love Mindset by Carol Dweck. Definitely a, a game changer for me. Are you a, are you a fan? Yeah, big, big fan. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it changed the game for me. Um, not only in how I work, um, but how I run a business, but especially how I parent as well with my two kids. It's just been absolutely, That's fantastic. yeah, just a complete game changer. So with that in mind, I've learned that I learn the most from my mistakes and from my failures. So I was wondering what's been your biggest mistake along the way and what did you learn from it? Uh, my biggest mistake today was deciding to drive at 5 a.m. to Tampa for a four hour meeting and then drive back to Orlando, but <laughs> on a more serious note. <laughs> yeah. Could have told you um, stay off of I-4, it's terrible. Uh, yeah, at, at that time of the morning, thankfully it was, it was pretty clear. Um, but you know, I would say over, over the years, I think probably I'll give you two mistakes. <laughs> One was probably, I've always had a passion for this and I think I, I wish I had sooner just kind of paid attention to where I really was lit up by these things and you know just gone after it sooner because I feel like I could have had an impact in this space a lot sooner but of course I learned along the way by doing things that I was you know less interested in it, it all told but um, I would say just now that I've learned a lot more about design thinking and user experience and I'm totally focused on putting the user first I think a lot of leaders have a tendency to want to come with the answer and just learning I think a little later in my career than I would have liked to really listen to the people I'm trying to solve the problem for has I would categorize that definitely as a mistake or something that if only I could tell myself 20 years ago to pay more attention to the people that are counting on me. 
Yeah. Focus on the user. Yeah. That, that stuff where you just tell people what they want, it, it really only works for Steve Jobs and not too many other people, right? <laughs> yeah. Actually, we were just talking about that in the meeting I just got out of where he was going crazy about the fonts on the iPhone. <laughs> so, so I've heard. So what was the other mistake? Oh, I was, the other mistake I was saying was just like not going after what I wanted to do sooner. Mm, okay. So seeing things that so you yeah, kind of do paying attention to your passions. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think going back to school was really kind of what crystallized that for me, learning from other students, learning from the professors and realizing, you know, it's never too late to make a career pivot. So mm -hmm. here I am leading career pivots for a thousand people. Yeah, that's huge. Well, with that in mind, I'm sure uh, human nature um, that there are or by by human nature, there are many people listening who are maybe enjoy their job, but also thinking about something else they might want to do or something they want to do differently. What's a piece of advice you would give to them if they've been putting that off? Oh, that's a, it's a great question. I mean, there was a great book that came out recently on this called When to Jump by a, a Bain a private equity investor who always wanted to become a professional squash player and <laughs> eventually just took that leap. Um, and I think there's great stories. The book is just a collection of stories of people who did that. But my advice to people would be that, I mean, I'm a cancer survivor, so I feel like you, yeah, I really have this perspective of you only live once. Uh, Cliché as that might sound, I think if you can put down on a piece of paper a three circle Venn diagram of what are you good at, what will people pay you to do, and what do you actually want to do, because often what you're good at is not what you want to do. <laughs> So right. if you can intersect what you're good at, what you want to do, and what people will pay you to do, whatever's in the center, just figure out a way to get there, find someone to guide you along the way, and just go for it. I mean, nothing is permanent. If it doesn't work out, you can always go back to what you used to do. I love that. It also reminds me of the book, uh, Designing Your Life by Bill Burnett, and uh, yeah. I'm trying to remember the other, his partner's name from Stanford. I've got the book on my shelf over there, but uh, also thinking about, you know, it has, has those circles and drawing things out, right? And where do you want to go? Yeah, work. I'm a math nerd, so I like to do everything based on math. <laughs> nice. Um, Data. Sarah, are there any other trends that you're paying attention to in learning that we haven't talked about today that you think are, are important um, for the future of work or how people are, are developing talent? Um, the only other thing, I don't know that this is a trend so much, but something I pay attention to and I think is tough for a lot of leaders to accept is that you know people are learning a lot more in bite-sized, consumable, mobile on the go type stuff. And a traditional leader wants to say, let me measure what people are learning. Let me measure what we're spending. How many hours did you spend learning this year? And I think it's hard for people who are used to the dollars and cents and the ROI, API, all the, any acronym you want. Um, I think it's, people are gonna have to get more comfortable that things that we, you and I may never have labeled learning, listening to your podcast, I consider I'm learning from other leaders, but am I, you know, down today saying I spent 45 minutes listening to Andy's podcast, so I spent 45 minutes learning. Of course not. But I think it's going to be very imperative for leaders of organizations to realize that um, it's not something you can measure as precisely as maybe you can measure your out-of-pocket spend on other things, and that's okay. I think it's fine if people are learning in different ways and different modalities. Um, you know, I, I see the job of a leader as just clearing a path for other people, just like point them in the right direction and get out of their way. So if they choose to learn on their phone from a TED talk, whatever, that's great. At least they're learning. Yeah, absolutely. So Sarah, we've mentioned a, a few books so far, Mindset by Carol Dweck. You mentioned uh, When to Jump uh, and Designing Your Life. Uh, what's another book that you often recommend or that has made a big impact on you? Uh, I read about 100 books a year, so that's a hard one to pick from, but I would say one I recommend a lot is Rookie Smarts by Liz Wiseman. Uh, I don't know if you've read that one. She's a Stanford professor. Looks like you have it on your shelf. I'm an audiobook person, so I don't know what the cover got, looks I've like. I've got it on my shelf. Yeah, absolutely. And I've got, um, so yeah, I, I think it's great. I uh, sitting on my desk <laughs> right here next to me as well. There you go. Uh, she's fantastic. And I think just the Rookie Smarts um, concept for your listeners who might not be familiar is this, you know, a lot of large or older, more mature organizations have a tendency to let people who've been around the block lead initiatives. And it yeah. can be really stifling because people are, you know, trying to tweak the way it is as opposed to trying to reimagine the way it could be and bringing in new talent and injecting people with different backgrounds and who just don't even know the constraints of how it used to be can be really, really creatively positive for, for teams. So I love that. One more I'll mention as well is Smart Cuts by Shane Snow. And it's, along the same lines of just thinking about problem solving differently and not just going down these heuristic patterns of how to get to the answers. 
I love that. And uh, I'm a, a big fan of Liz Weissman and her work and uh, Multipliers, of course, uh, I've mentioned this podcast many times, not just because it's a great book, but I also run a simulation based on that book. Um, I saw that actually. <laughs> I didn't even think of that when I mentioned Rookie Smarts. Yeah, well, and, and she wrote Rookie Smarts um, with some people I worked with uh, in the past. In fact, one of my friends, Dylan Lee, is mentioned in that book. Uh, That's right. And I'm, and I'm a big fan of that. You mentioned design thinking earlier. I see yep. those things in the innovative mindset um, or innovative culture. I think all that kind of goes together is, is being able to put aside the way that people have done things in the past and be open to fresh ideas because that's how we innovate. That's how we're going to be able to disrupt ourselves before we get disrupted by others, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I'm just, I will consume as much knowledge as I can and I feel like we're all learning as we go. The world keeps changing. So paying attention to what other leaders are, are doing. And, you know, a lot of people are much more willing now than they used to be in sharing their failures. And I think that we can all learn from each other. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, last question for you, Sarah, for anyone out there uh, leading talent development at another organization that is looking to also future-proof their workforce and get them ready and, and lead them through this digital transformation, what's one more piece of advice you would give to them as they uh, take on this giant task? Oh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to just come back to treating them as your customer or the consumer of your employee experience. But I think just bigger than that, obviously, paying attention to the crowd, the voice of the crowd, um, and letting people build communities. Don't be afraid to let people self-organize and, you know, resist the urge to um, put a lot of a structure in place. I think that can be really stifling. I like to, to call what I, I and my team do as intentional chaos. So, you know, we're behind the scenes making sure it doesn't go off the rails, but we let people be a little bit more uh, free than they might have been in the past. Excellent. Well, Sarah, I know you are uh, prolific out there on social media. What's the best place for people to get in touch with you or to follow you and learn more about what you're doing? Uh, LinkedIn or Twitter is great. Um, open to sharing with anyone and love to follow new people as well. So, Try, try my best to stay on top of all the, the content on there. Um, so that's the best place to find me. Either one, I'm on there every day. Awesome. Uh, I am as well. And uh, that's how we connected. So uh, glad that we are connected. And I really appreciate you coming on to share some of your knowledge and your wisdom and your experience with uh, our listeners. So thanks again for coming on the Talent Development Hot Seat. Sure. We'll send you over some astronaut stickers. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Take care, Sarah. All right. You too.